Roberto for hosting me in this wonderful space. And by the way, if you haven't done so already, please uh, support and donate to Ideas Block. I think it's really worth it. Now, naturally, I am quite happy to be here and having the opportunity to uh, share a lot of my thoughts and um, equally happy to see you here as well. I'm glad you're interested in the subject and uh, hopefully by the end of the evening we will have indeed our minds sharpened and there will be a lot of new uh, ideas, thoughts and most importantly questions. So to start with, um, allow me to share a few more details about my artistic practice. As uh, Roberto said, I am a composer of experimental and electroacoustic music. I also do installation works and music for films and theater performances. Almost always my compositions begin outside the studio. I visit uh, urban or rural environments, such as this one, and I record the sounds of the, of the environment. Um, the sound sources can be anything, from wind blowing through trees, from waves crashing on the seashore, to ventilation drones and uh, passing trains. I then uh, return to the studio and I use the recordings as sonic material. With specialized software, I edit, manipulate, juxtapose and sequence the recordings, ending up with uh, electroacoustic compositions, let's say, with electroacoustic music. Um, the works are usually published as albums. Uh, for example, the sounds from Nida are released as a digital download. They were used in this composition. But besides online availability, I, um, I also release my music in uh, physical, handheld formats. Perhaps surprisingly, the cassette tape has become rather popular these days. But fortunately for sound quality's sake, there are still record labels that release CDs, despite the admittedly very limited uh, commercial value. A perhaps more important aspect of my artistic practice is performing my music live in concerts. Um, I am particularly interested in the relationship between sound and space. And ideally in concerts I have the opportunity to explore that in depth. Therefore I perform my music in uh, spaces such as this one technologically innovative and uh, designed and built to accommodate uh, multi-channel sound works uh, and offer the audience an immersive experience in a surround sound environment. I'm also interested in spaces that are acoustically vibrant and uh, heavily influenced by the architectonic properties for example, the Church of Philip and Jacob here in Vilnius, near the river, where I presented a piece during the Jana Musica Festival a few years ago. I have also presented my work in spaces that have absolutely no relation with music. In the last edition of the Musica Ertveje Festival, I performed my piece in Vilnius Dektine. The aim was to open up new possibilities and new perceptions of uh, sound uh, within a, a factory as an environment. The last example is from the stadium of the ancient Greek city of Messini, where I was commissioned to premiere a new work. Um, the entire stadium became a huge loudspeaker echoing my music all over the valley in a dialogue between the contemporary and the ancient. Now a little bit about my installation work. Um, first from Kaunas and the Biennale from 2015. 
in collaboration with a media artist from Croatia, uh, we invited the visitors of the exhibition to interact with the material by walking on it and have the embodied experience of crushing the plaster and listening to the sound that is produced by this particular activity. Another installation work was uh, based on field recordings from clay peda. I was invited to combine several sounds of the city and relocate them in the foyer of the clay peda concert hall. Concert goers would uh, listen to this imaginary soundscape through different settings of loudspeakers before the musical performances or after them. Now, the reason I am mentioning all these parts of my experience is not to do shameless self-promotion, as the term goes, but it is exactly these experiences that fuel many of the thoughts that I will share with you tonight. So, at this point, it is important to clarify that uh, a lot of my arguments are results of self-reflection and that maybe at some points I will reach a bit of a confessional level. Uh, consequently, I won't be necessarily backing up my arguments with uh, related literature and resources. And furthermore, it goes without saying that uh, I won't be presenting an authoritarian view of what music and sound art are or are not. And in addition, any historical or contextual background will be by default non-linear, fragmented and incomplete. The aim is to open up a dialogue, not only between music and sound art, as I experience them through my artistic practice and research, but also between myself and you. This means that in a typical mind sharpener fashion, the second half of the event will be basically a dialogue where you can make comments, ask questions, and of course, share your own experiences on the subjects. So, let's, let's look at our main question. What is the difference between music and sound art? This question has been troubling me for many years now. Allow me to share an anecdote. In 2012, I performed in Rotterdam. And before the concert, there was uh, an artist talk followed by a Q&A session. So somebody asked me if I consider what I do to be music or sound art. I replied humorously. I said that I consider it music. But when I apply for funding, I call it sound art. Despite the joke, the, the question stuck on me. I kept on thinking about it, and uh, obviously I still do. In fact, the question is becoming rather critical as I gain experience as a lecturer here in Lithuania. I see a number of students from new media arts, music production, composition, electronic performance, who are uh, both from uh, VDU in Kaunas as well as here in the Music Academy, who are trying to find the limits between music and sound art and identify their own practice within them. Where does music end and sound art begins? I think our subject today is worth exploring as it affects educational strategies, theoretical discourse, and artistic practice. So, firstly, let's examine music, an activity that is essentially as old as humankind. Nevertheless, as uh, ethnomusicologists explain, music is, of course, the production of musical sounds, but it is also, and that is equally important, the construction of the cultural framework of the 
community that performs it. In consequence, music is defined differently in each community or society as it depends on a specific historical background, religion, even geographical location. So, what is music in our society? And by that I mean art music. Let's just call it that for the sake of conversation, okay? And Western society in uh, the early, now middle, almost 21st century. How do we understand and experience music? What kinds of sounds or sonic elements are qualified and perceived as musical? And in what kind of social conditions? In an attempt to give an answer, I will focus on a huge shift uh, in Western art music that occurred in the late 19th century, but still affects the practice. The person, one of the people responsible for this shift, was French composer Claude Debussy. As musicologist and author Christopher Small explains, Debussy was arguably the first composer to push Western music beyond tonality, that is, beyond the established rules of tonal harmony as they have been developing since the 16th century, let's say. Debussy was not focusing on the idea of anticipation and resolution, which was traditionally created by sequencing dissonant and resonant chords, but he was focusing on sound's physical qualities, its texture, color, and timbre. Previously, Western art music um, was based on the, an abstract relationship between notes that was placed on a piece of paper. Of course, sound was important, but it always came afterwards. The, the musical qualities, the value of a composition was embedded in the score. Contrarily, Debussy's music and compositions like Prelude à l'après-midi d'enfant from 1894 and La Cathédrale Engloutie from 1910 have the meaning in sound. They are here and now experiences of an opening to the nature of sound as such, and in extension, an opening to nature itself. Now, Debussy was not the only composer at that time to open up music and musical thinking to sounds of the environment. <coughs> Maurice Ravel, composer of the famous Bolero, had some very insightful thoughts uh, and he wrote them down during a journey on a streamer down the river Rhine. It is a bit lengthy, but I think worth quoting in full. Towards evening, we went down to see the factories. How can I tell you about these great smelting castles, these great incandescent cathedrals, and the wonderful symphony of traveling belts, whistles, and terrific hammer blows in which you are submerged? And everywhere in the sky, a scorching deep red. On top of it all, a storm broke. How much music is in all this? And I certainly intend to use it. What we notice here is Ravel's astonishment with uh, industrial sounds of the machines, what we can simply call noise. After all, uh, already in uh, in that time, as a sonic byproduct of the Industrial Revolution, the noise of factories was a part of the soundscape, especially in urban environments. Of course, the most uh, famous uh, statement about the use of noise within musical context was by uh, Luigi Russolo, who in his Futurist Manifesto provocatively claimed that 
we delight much more in combining in our thoughts the noises of trams, of automobile engines, of carriages and brawling crowds than in hearing again and again the Eroica and the Pastorale. Poor Beethoven. Now, these ideas eventually legitimized the use of noise in music making, ignoring, at least partly, the old rules regarding harmony, melody, and uh, rhythm. There is a Q&A session right afterwards. Uh, hold that thought, please. Okay. All right. Um, but there was another element also considered unwelcomed or awkward in musical performances that became central to some composers and sound practitioners. What we may describe as the opposite of noise, silence. I can only assume that at that time, silence was used as a way of resisting the rapidly increasing tempo of everyday life and creating a much needed stillness. Also, it might have been a resistance to the often overwhelming blasts of noise that were dominating the environment. And moreover, the atrocities of World War I showed that the glorious mechanical world that Rusolo and his uh, futurist companions envisioned could be very quickly transformed into literally a graveyard. One of the first compositions to fully encompass silence was In Futurum by Czech composer Erwin Schulhoff. If you can read music, I hope it's visible. The, the, the whole score consists only of pauses. The performer did not make any sound at all. You can see that's 1919. It's a bit quick. Uh, most often, music history mistakenly attributes the first silent piece to John Cage and his famous 4 minutes and 33 seconds, which was composed basically nearly three, de three decades after In Futuru. Nevertheless, Cage's composition is indeed significant. It established the opening to the sounds of the environment as part of the musical vocabulary. Moreover, it emphasized the importance of listening as an active way for audiences to engage with the music. The seeds planted by Debussy blossomed into Cage's ideas about silence and ultimately led R. Murray Schaffer, that's the founder of the acoustic ecology discipline, to predict that the blurring of the edges between sound and environmental, uh, between music and environmental sounds may eventually prove to be the most striking feature in all of 20th century music. Towards the end of the 19th century, there was another groundbreaking event that drastically transformed music. In 1877, Thomas Edison invented the phonograph the first ever recording device. With recording, music became a thing, an object with material substance. Music renegotiated its connection with time and space. This means that the musical experience no longer required the presence of performers, and it could be repeated whenever and wherever. Originally, sound recording technologies used to capture sound, to document musical performances. It was decades after the invention of the phonograph that recording technologies were advanced enough to allow composers to use recordings as sonic material. The first composer to create a piece based exclusively on recordings was Halim Eldab from Egypt. In 1944, he secretly entered a temple 
and recorded women performing the ritual of Zar. I say secretly because only women were allowed to perform Zar. Afterwards, with the technological tools he, he had available at his hands, El Dab manipulated the recordings of the women's voices and transformed them into an abstract material that finally became the expression of Zar, arguably the first ever electronic music piece. It is noticeable that the piece was not premiered in a concert hall, but in a gallery. My assumption is that El Dab correctly recognized that the piece necessitated a different context and social conditions in order to reach out to the public. The expression of Zar is a great example of a work created beyond music's historical restrictions, a piece in need of a revised cultural uh, con uh, conditions and contexts to, fully, to be fully experienced, to fully experience the impact. The work also demonstrates the changes in music making at the period we're discussing were not only conceptual, but also deeply affected by technological innovation. Naturally, since the mid 1940s, music continued to evolve. And throughout the years, alternative terms have been used in an attempt to clarify the art of composing with sounds. Electronic, tape, electroacoustic, computer music, sonic art, sound-based music, noise music, soundscape composition. All these terms usually are categorized under a more generic and broader umbrella of experimental music and sound art. It appears that in our society, music remains open or even resistant to definition. The plethora of terms recruited to define the practice highlights its ambiguity, what it is, and what it aims to communicate, what it does. I believe this ambiguity and this openness is unavoidable because of the very nature of sound. Elusive and immaterial, sound has this ghostly quality that makes it difficult, if not impossible, to objectify, restrain and categorize. In extension, the attempt to define sound art appears like a futile task. Typically, sound art refers to modern and contemporary artworks that foreground sound. Nah, not really. We can also claim that sound art blurs the limits between music and art. It is art to listen to. Okay, that's a bit better. Students at VDU have come with their own quite interesting definitions. Sound art is music. Because when you put sounds together in an artistic way, you make music. Yet it can be put also a bit more poetically, like painting with our ears. Acknowledging and embracing sound's ambiguous nature and its openness to interpretation, media artist John Griesnick invites us to ask, is after all sound art a discipline, a genre, or perhaps a style? In any case, the term is rather recent. It originated in the late 1980s, early 1990s, and it took almost an additional decade before it started becoming established uh, as an independent discipline and as a field for academic study and aesthetic analysis. 
Nowadays, uh, sound is accepted as an equal partner among other creative media, and sound art is taking a central stage in the contemporary art scene. For example, in 2010, Susan Phillips won, with, with her work Lowlands, won the first ever, was, excuse me, was the first ever sound artist to win the prestigious Turner Prize Award. Never before the award was given to an artwork that did not include any visual elements. In 2013, uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the MoMA, presented its first ever retrospective exhibition of sound art. Sounding brought together visual arts, architecture, performance, computer programming, and music to underline how we listen determines how we hear. Instead, indeed, the works provoke and evoke both to the maker and to the music core modes of active listening as a and also a heightened relationship between all interior and exterior space. Two years later, the National Gallery in London presented the Soundscapes exhibition. Described as immersive and site-specific, the experience of Soundscapes encouraged the visitors to hear the painting and see the sound. For Soundscapes, the National Gallery commissioned uh, sound recordists, media artists, DJs, and uh, composers to respond to a painting and create a soundtrack that uh, the visitors could listen on headphones while looking at the artwork. These examples demonstrate that sound art now plays a pivotal role in uh, contemporary art discourse and extends its limits, especially in relation to space architecture and audiovisual perception. Established institutes such as the Tate and MoMA, I dare to call them temples of visual arts, have opened their doors to sound. However, as uh, author and uh, scholar Christopher Cox notices, this openness is also creating an anxiety about the new guest. Cox highlights that sound is almost always accepted only in combination with other media. The essentially obligatory visuality testifies that sound per se is considered limited, at least in within the institutionalized visual arts world. And this raises a key question. How do we exhibit sound? How do we bring the ethereal and invisible into spaces that are traditionally designed to accommodate and stimulate visual experiences? It in, in response to this, and contrary to MoMA and the National Gallery, the Museum of Reina Sofia in Madrid is organizing this spring, Audiosfera. It is an exhibition with no images or objects, underpinned solely by sound works, and an exhibition design that facilitates experiential, profound and prolonged listening. These um, conceptual and curatorial challenges emphasize the differences between seeing and listening, between the visual and the sonic. After comparing these differences, author and scholar Marcel Combusin concludes that the field of gaze is exterior, contrary to the depth of the range of listening. In other words, the eye explores surfaces while the ear penetrates. 
the eye divides, analyzes, and categorizes, whereas the ear is receptive and intuitive. It perceives the whole as one. Listening means being in sound, while seeing emphasizes the distance between and the dichotomy between object and subject. I will take it a little bit further and add that listening is participation, whereas seeing is observation, usually of a spectacle. Furthermore, as anthropologist and specialist in sound perception Yegor Reznikov explains, sound is related to our deepest, that is to say, the very first levels of consciousness, those appearing already in the period before birth. This means that the first sense we develop, while still in our mother's wombs, is listening. And sound through sound, we begin understanding ourselves and the environment. Moreover, sound functions on a primitive, pre-linguistic level. I believe this explains why it is often so difficult to describe the impact sound has on us. Sound is always something beyond an object of study. We don't listen to sound, we listen in sound. The comparison between visuality and orality is showing there is this complex and dynamic relationship between them. I want to point out that the values of our visually dominated society and culture can or perhaps should be challenged through a renewed emphasis on sound and a shift of attention in the act of listening. I suggest listening to see things differently, in a broader sense. In my opinion, this will intensify the engagement with audiovisual arts, yes, but it will also deepen the way we experience our world in total. Now, Let's explore uh, a very typical theoretical distinction between music and sound art, in which music is based on performance. It is a floating and temporal event that unfolds in time. In contrast, sound art is uh, exhibited. It is permanent, static, and site-specific, strongly related to architecture and space. A characteristic example, the work of uh, sound installation pioneer Max Neuhaus. Although an accomplished percussionist, Neuhaus felt restricted by music's temporal framework, so he decided to remove his work from time of music and instead set it in space of sound. In his 1966 piece Listen, he invited the audience in a concert venue, but only to stamp their hands with the word listen. He then guided them outside the venue in a tour of the city and encouraged them to uh, aesthetically engage with the sounds of the environment beyond a musical context. To focus more on time, we can look into author and improvising musician David Toop, who claims that uh, due to its short duration, musical composition offers limited experiences of listening to the sounds of the environment. And he continues that sound art challenges these musical configurations uh, as it is often working on longer circles of time and more open structures. According to Toop, 
this approach may result in a greater appreciation and awareness of the sonic environment. Nevertheless, even if true, uh, this has some important social implications. It is my opinion that open structures and extended durations require the person who experiences the sound art piece to perceive time in an individualistic manner. If we examine the exhibition setting, it relies on the idea of visitors individually deciding on the duration of engagement with, let's say, an installation piece. And they determine the entry and exit points of interest from a personal perspective. This also results in the traditional role of the composer being diminished, if not relinquished. Now it is the visitor who has the responsibility to place sounds in time within his or her own um, way. In contrast, a music in a music performance, the listeners experience the work in its whole, identifying a clear beginning and ending, thus communally having a full awareness of its entire form. Of course, members of audiences can walk out uh, during a musical performance, but as we know, that's rarely uh, welcomed or accepted. A music performance is an activity that brings people together in a ritual, offering the opportunity to share what uh, Theologian Jeremy Begbie describes as an extraordinary sense of embedded togetherness, which at the same time is allowing for or even encouraging particularity and uniqueness. With these remarks, I want to highlight the vital importance of the communal experience of musical performance as it gives the listeners a sense of belonging and taking part in something shared in the same place and in the same time. In our society where individualism thrives, attending a performance means that even for a little bit we become members of a temporal community called audience. Moreover, it is essential to highlight that Music does not unfold in the actual time of everyday life, nor it attempts to imitate it. Instead, music creates time, as it is defined in theological terms as sacred time that transcends ordinary temporal duration. The thoughts of uh, Japanese composer Toru Takemichu are, are interesting in this, because he underlines music's immeasurable metaphysical sense of time that uh, generates new meanings and transforms human consciousness. A music performance is demarcated by silence, which creates a, a crack in the timeline uh, between the mystic sonic world of music and the place where performers and listeners existed before. This idea is expressed visually by Leonello Ballestreri in a painting called Beethoven, sometimes known as the Kreutzer Sonata. The five people in the audience do not just stay quiet and listen. They are in exaltation towards the spiritual realm individually participating in a sacred ceremony. To return to Debussy's time, around the end of the century, the concert venue had already become a temple for music and the concert was transformed into a ritual with particular social and uh, cultural settings. 
As we discussed earlier, the settings are constantly changing. But I strongly believe that the esoteric and primordial, the pure quality and power of music transcends eras and styles when we strip it down to its bare essence. Music, as the word suggests, is the summoning of the muse, of a creature that exists beyond the realms of physical reality. So whether we call it experimental, electroacoustic, avant-garde or anything else, music manifests a profound human need to engage and communicate with the otherworldly. And in fact, the more we try that, the more we try to seek what I can call the divine, the more we experience and understand what it means to be a human. It is my suggestion that sound art lacks these types of aims, although elements such as the transition from the music venue to the public space and the rejection of the established and authoritative role of the composer, usually white male, I may add, helps us to raise some very critical social and aesthetical questions regarding the impact of sound in our lives. Practitioners and theorists alike praise sound art for opening spaces, for thought and discourse, for provoking artistic concepts, and for escaping categorizations. However, this openness comes with a price. If sound art can be almost anything related to sound, then it risks at becoming nothing. Max Neuhaus takes it as far as to claim that the so-called sound art is nothing but a trend. Commenting on this, Christopher Cox underlines a general suspicion that the label sound art is basically a way to repackage music uh, in response to a raising art market and a struggling music industry. With sound, with sound art being so young, historically, I mean, perhaps it is too early to tell if that is true or not. Nevertheless, uh, bringing in the conversation words such as industry and market can make some people, myself included, feel a little bit skeptical about it. It is reasonable to question and doubt the, the values and aims of any art that uh, is designed simply to satisfy uh, certain needs and uh, is tailored in accordance to specific requests of institutes, uh, galleries and other establishments of authority. But is that indeed a problem? And if yes, how can we solve this? These are not rhetorical questions. I can assume that any solutions we will find as we go down the road. In any case, and to wrap things up, regardless of musical or artistic contexts and frameworks, we have to acknowledge that sound has a powerful influence on us from a very personal subconscious level to a wider historical and uh, social context. Ultimately, sound is a cosmic and standalone energy. To engage profoundly with sound, we must, above anything else, open up our ears and listen. 
According to composer Alvin Lussier, careful listening is more important than making sounds happen. Listening, therefore, is not, being, is not about being passive receivers, but active and creative human beings. Let's try to do that a little bit more often. Thank you for your attention. Now, as I said in the beginning, the important aspect of mind sharpener is the discourse, the back and forth. For that, I will definitely need a glass of wine <laughs> or two. Actually, that was for me, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, as I said, I'm open to comments, questions, um, your sharing of experiences regarding the subject, anything that comes to mind. Have some, yeah, please. Yeah. Drink a little bit, it will come. Yeah. <laughs> um, so going back to what I was just curious, <coughs> this um, industrial sounds, somehow I don't associate them with what I was used in mind specifically, because I usually I think, can think about doing very quiet or sure. soft sure, kind sure, of sure. calming melodies. There are some distorted string sounds sometimes. But Absolutely. I'm just curious. Absolutely. And from, from, what, from what I saw, it, besides the actual quote, it, uh, the, I, I'll, I'll reply to about Ravel specifically, and then I'll extend it a little bit. Okay? Sure. Okay, so, uh, I'll just take the very famous Bolero, and, the, and I will connect a little bit with, uh, with Debussy. When I was studying, even back in the 90s, <laughs> sorry, internal joke here, um, <laughs> When I was studying in the 90s, um, teachers would say Bolero being like super simple. It's just a melody and this repetitive rhythm. And it's all about orchestration. And reading about these things nowadays, I, I understood that himself, Bolero, was saying like, ah, this is not a good musical piece. Of course, because it lacked all the dissonance, resonance, the surprises and all these things that were coming from the Romantic era. But sonically, the orchestration is so brilliant, this build-up, you can tell his interest in the impact of sound, the, the accelerato, the crescento, the, the, the textures, the, how he doubles instruments. Naturally, this does not relate to pure noise music, but you can see his thinking is about orchestration and it does matter. It was not long uh, before the time that orchestration was basically uh, high voices will go to the violins, low voices will go to the contrabass. Bolero really looked into the color of the orchestra. If you think about the piece, the whole thing about texture, color and timbre, same as Debussy. And I'm mentioning Debussy and Bolero as a little bit of um, uh, kind of like resisting to the very traditional approach that says noise and music, futurists, that was a start. And I want to point out that composers were already opening their ears to the environment, were already understanding the notion of noise and how we can bring it into as pure sound into the score without necessarily thinking about how do we go from dissonant to resonance and back again? How do we go from anticipation to resolution? And I really think he transcends that. I hope that answers your question. And more, more, or less, less. <laughs> well, no, more, more, or more, less, yeah. Any other thoughts and comments? I have one. You were talking about the perception of the sound. Mm. And you were saying that uh, people perceive sound as one and do not analyze it. This is how I understood this. Yeah. Well, On a deeper level, that's a whole case. I mean, starting from before we were born, yeah. the fact that we start perceiving sound before making words for it yeah. hits us in a way that we cannot really describe it. Analysis comes from, you know, the idea that we can use language to, I think linguists here might know and they might tell it better, that, you know, we use language to create meanings. Yeah, but this is the same as with visual perception. No, that's completely different. Because Why? with visuals, it's always me and you, because sound comes from within and from around you. Yeah, sound is always 3D. Yeah, but 
и по-старсимо хуме, би по-добре, не виж. True that, actually, yeah. That's a good remark. Because we, we see and then we, we don't really associate. True, true. But uh, obviously, it's uh, in terms of uh, chronologically, sound comes before that. So, uh, but definitely, yeah, seeing that's a good remark, actually, yeah. Seeing definitely comes before language as well. But after asking you to learn language, we start to analyze it. Absolutely. I mean, we can't escape that. I, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It's not one way or the other. I'm just pointing out that sound has this very profound roots. But then it is in our nature, let's say, to also analyze things. We want to put them in, uh, in, in order. We want to put them in context. And for me, that's a fascinating thing when we're trying to utilize language uh, to, to describe the undescribable. And where does that stop? I, I really like this. I'll make it in a bit of a joke when you say, I cannot find words to describe how much I love you. Well, you just did. Mm -hmm. It's always like, oh, it's love. I'm not going to take, oh, it's love. But, but you understand that meaning. It's like this sort of emotion that you... It's right there, but you're not there yet. And the, the more you find, you know, the more you define it, the more it escapes definition, and you try to define it again, it escapes again, and so on. And uh, it's completely different in the way we understand and analyze seeing and visuals through uh, categorizing and uh, putting in boxes and so on. There's another thing with uh, the pre-linguistic perception that uh, we see sound as a... We see, see this is visual culture dominance here. Everything, every perception is about seeing. Seeing is believing and all that nonsense. Anyway, <laughs> just don't mind me if the wine talking. Um, it's a metaphor. And I suppose they're useful. Sure, but they do point out uh, a lot about how society perceives things. Mm -hmm. Anyway, going back to the visual and the prelingual and all those things, I, I do believe that the, uh, that the impact of sound hits us in such a way that almost sends us back to this uh, period where we were in this safe liquid environment uh, without you know, knowing exactly who we are and where do we start and where the environment stops. But when you're saying this, it means that you think that people use the, by listening only the prelingual memories, no? Oh, no they, they're there as well. I think uh, what I want to point out, they're both there. And I, I'm saying this almost to uh, contradict a little bit the, the whole recent trend of sound studies where they tend to analyze everything and uh, making everything really, like, put it, they, they want to bring a lot of scientific approaches into that. That's why I said about object and subject and control. Because with, with, with sound, there's no object and subject, essentially. So when you categorize and analyze, you have to keep your distance. And I'll, I'll talk about playing with words, if I may. Ha having a, a Greek background, in my mother's tongue, the word for science is epistemi, which literally means I stand above. I, I look from a distance. Mm -hmm. And you cannot have a distance with sound. Sound is inside, outside at the same time. And that contradicts the scientific approach of categorizing, making sure that everything is in order. And then we conclude to safe results and we can, I don't know, build an airplane cure cancer, uh, fix a computer, connect to the internet. Wonderful things. Nothing against science. I'm just trying to point out the difference in the approach. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually, because this, uh, yes, okay, sound is more <coughs> primitive, but at the same time, I think you, she has a point that, in the sense that, like, sometimes when you hear certain musical compositions, it sounds, because, like, you know, speaking, after all, started with babbling. You know, like ba or like ma or like ba or whatever. <laughs> so and some some parts of music are almost like that. Like sometimes I feel like maybe music started because it has a like a very primitive language vocabulary. There's no. It's okay. It's like pure emotions. It's like before you knew you were capable of communicating words. I I, I mean maybe actually some generation of prehistoric. Mm. Humanoid was actually just, I guess, communicating in sounds which represented either anger, uh, sadness, or happiness, or you know, some other variant of that. And in that perspective, actually, music is very linguistic. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I'm, I'm not taking anything away from that. Uh, and all, not, not only linguistic, but I mentioned the importance of social context. What sound, what bow or bo or bing 
might uh, be relevant and musically uh, understandable from one culture might not be from another. So yeah, language comes into place, form, structure, uh, I'll put it this way, we combined the Apollonian and the Dionysian. The calculating uh, uh, structure with the ecstatic primordial element. Bringing these together, you should know better, I think Nietzsche mentioned that, you know, the ancient Greek tragedy and all that stuff, but it does apply to uh, a lot of the musical uh, understandings we have uh, within our society. So it's definitely both Greek gods there. Second Greek reference. In the third one, I need to drink another glass of this, okay? And this doubling and sound and language thing we talk about in Freiburg, we just did some research in order to try to see whether like embryo, like in the womb, they could recognize uh, speech sounds, which mm -hmm. they can't. But but they do recognize the other mom's voice, uh, yeah. the female texture. voice texture. Yeah, yeah. So like, not they they're not able to discriminate between speech sounds because, as you said, speech comes down to that. Yeah. But but yeah, they are they are sensitive to sounds even from the womb before they're born actually. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, please. Uh, actually, two questions following each other. Mm -hmm. uh, Marco, so why do you think vision is so much? Uh, more dominant than sound. Which and one? Sorry, vision. Yeah. Is it more yeah. dominant than no, for example, vision? Yeah. And mm -hmm. would you say that people who prefer vision more are more superficial than just Abs yeah. absolutely not. The second one, <laughs> absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, but but pointing out the need to be sensitive in our oral. Um, this is a bit of me having a glass of wine and a little bit of what I've read mm -hmm. about the subject. A lot of things changed uh, when the typography was invented. We, we had oral traditions that really um, kind of like uh, arranged the way we perceive the world, the way we communicate, the way we make meaning. And then all of a sudden, and especially re uh, regarding religious meanings, uh, stuff that were important back then, you know, to bring communities together, to have a common understanding about life. And all of a sudden you print the Bible and everybody has this and to to understand the, the meanings of God and then also on other things it expanded obviously in every social aspect of our lives and that onwards and the technological development of uh, visual uh, stimulation uh, became much much more uh, dominant uh, society today the, the jump uh, fast forward uh, how many years from the Freud Gutenberg I don't remember anyway f a few hundred years mm -hmm. forward yeah, um, we can see it this way. Uh, what is the most precious thing we need and we lack these days? Time, because we're always in a rush, especially even in Vilnius, a, a, a city that's supposed to be a bit more laid back. We, we live here and we're like, okay, it's only half a million of us here, everything is pretty cool. No, you know, we really need to open up our Google Calendar to arrange to meet a friend. We lack time. Sorry, no time. I couldn't email you this and that. You know how it goes, right? So. My point is that when you lack time, it's easy to get all the stimulation you need from an image. You don't need unfolding time to perceive an image. Well, ah, yeah, next. Ah, yes. It's what I call you know, the Instagram effect. But sound requires time. Music requires time. If you don't have that, then you cannot spend it in perceiving the world, social messages, um, you know, the environment, or anything related through images. It's only uh, through sound. It's only through images. Siri, shall we take it outside then? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm pleased about that, but, um, but um, because most people, I suspect, now listen to music while doing something else. And one of the reasons why, especially hip hop is very popular, but also I might say, okay, other kinds of music, and I feel better for that, is that music is a kind of like, you know, painting, you have to, okay, you can only spend five seconds. some time in your space, it's okay, hey, hey, look, you have a temporal commitment, whereas with music, actually, you can spend, like, your work days, like, listening to music, and, like, you can be, like, vibing, and, well, you know, debatable what we were committed to, the road, or, hmm. or thinking about what would happen at work and dispute with your boss, or 
for the music itself. So, so lots of music is, I think, very popular for Mahat, but not precisely because the people, it's people frequently, if not mostly, don't commit to it more than as a secondary thing in their environment as mm. us. And in this way, it seems to me to join sound art because it's basically just like a subtext of your, the context yeah. of your life. Yeah, it's what I mentioned earlier about recording, making music available everywhere. So it's not that we're not, uh, yeah, you know what, we're, we are lis we're not listening to music, we're hearing music every day, all day. So there's a big difference because, yeah, music is present everywhere. You know, if you walk in here at any moment besides uh, presentations, <laughs> there's music playing. If you walk into the shopping center, there's music playing. And uh, a lot of people say that recordings killed music, killed this, you know, the presence, the, you know, the, we live in the moment kind of thing. The same way that, um, there's a bold statement, I don't remember who made it, that um, something like, uh, liter uh, again, printing killed literature. Mm. Because art is not supposed to be a dead object, it's supposed to be an activity, an ongoing activity. And uh, as a musician myself, the, uh, the first thing, I, well, like, the musician dictator, the first thing I would do is like ban music in public spaces performed by loudspeakers because it really degrades the, you know, the, the artistic aspect of that. It reduces it to some sort of sonic tapestry. And I, I, there are times where it's actually clever and it does make a sense, but most of the times music in public spaces uh, is not there to enable the space to create an atmosphere, but basically to mute other sounds and impose some sort of uh, specific way of perceiving the space. Mm -hmm. Example, the shopping centers. You walk into the, to the kind of like uh, up-tempo, fancy space, you understand that we want teenage clients here, the, the clothes are a bit cheaper, <laughs> come inside here. Even the worst examples, the ones which like make you wish like for it was like uh, five hours of John Cage silence instead. <laughs> But what about like, uh, you know, okay, when you go to like a uh, jazz music, actually you can speak to other people while, you know, while you're, you're playing. And, you know, in concert halls before 19th century, like Sorry. Vivaldi's time, I saw pictures or paintings or actually where, you know, people were like walking around and greeting each other. It was like a party almost while they exactly. were playing the Four Seasons or I don't know, some, some jazz like that. Absolutely. That, that's what, that's what I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, music, as I said, Western art music, as we understand it now, has this concert tradition of be becoming a ritual in its own right. Uh, because, indeed, until even almost, the, well, definitely late Mozart times, people would go to a concert, they would cheer, they would eat, they would have a chat. Music was part, as you know, very important always to acknowledge, of the social conditions. Uh, and then the social conditions kind of like isolated it and they put it into this place you have to be quiet <laughs> like nobody walks in or out and everything is quite strict and I think that the good thing with sound art it kind of like went okay hold on okay we've done that but let's try a few other things as well and maybe at the end of the day we can combine the best out of every situation and bring them together in some sort of new form of music making that's the idealist in me speaking right now I don't really think it will happen but uh, the, the fact remains that um, uh, socially, a, a jazz concert, yeah, you're, su you're actually supposed to applaud in a nice solo. You're supposed to be much more interactive in that sense. What I want to say is that even if you're a listener in the typical classical concert setting, you are not passive. You're not just there to receive sound. You're very active. You're doing <coughs> something very important and very profound. And this idea of always kind of like talking, always interacting, always doing something is creating hell of a lot of metaphorical noise in our world. And I think this world is becoming way too loud in that sense. We need really to just step back a little bit, close our mouths and open up our ears, not only to music, but in general, try to understand what the hell is going on. I don't know about you, but for me, this world seems pretty noisy and pretty scary. I think you should, yeah, you should go to Shumash and like do a petition for <laughs> Shut down all music in my closed <laughs> restaurant. I'm market. afraid it's only a very, very, and how to say, uh, incomplete silence. solution. To I'm so well, um, <laughs> volcanoes or comets are far better to to uh, would be more radical. Volcanoes, comets, things like that would be a much better solution than me going and asking for music. <laughs> One, two.
please. Uh, sorry, he, he was in my... Just, uh, just come back a little bit to be a bit about music and the sound art concept. You said it was a huge change on from DBC time, as you see it. Mm. Uh, but what about the people who didn't know? Maybe they already found it and it said it was Western civilization. What about some Oriental things? What you maybe have some thoughts Absolutely. about what happened there. Maybe they didn't. They found this sound art already in the music. Oh, or maybe Absolutely, absolutely. Well, for the you know, so that I wouldn't bore you to death with a five-hour lecture or something like that. I would mention that the the prime influence from of Debussy was music from Bali, from Indonesia. He heard, he had the opportunity in the Paris exhibition of eighteen eighty-seven. I don't remember now. To, to listen to music from Bali, uh, and particularly Gamelan. It's a completely different approach on what he knew as a composer. And the thing was that Bali, uh, Debussy was already a bit uncomfortable with the whole thing about Western music as he was being taught and what he wanted to do. And he saw these guys playing in a completely different way, using rhythm and melodies in completely different ways. It's like, that's it. So. Uh, the openness was not only to the sound of the environment, was o opening our ears to the world in general. Technologically, that was uh, possible because boats would be faster, you could hear musicians from Bali, and then recording would make, you would make it possible to hear music, I don't know, from the Amazon forest and so on and so on. So yeah, absolutely, there are, uh, the, I think it's generally ac um, acknowledged that a lot of... Um, uh, ideas that influenced the music in the West since the BC were basically non-Western, or a cage as well, definitely, supposedly, that I read that actually it's not really correct, but his Zen Buddhism thing was part of the practice, uh, Stockhausen as well, uh, Jonathan Harvey from England, they really looked into uh, various uh, types of uh, uh, spiritual practices, religions, uh, musical practices, instrumentation, approaches social structures from non-Western civilizations and with a typical colonial Western style. They said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to adapt it. I'm going to do whatever I want. But that was pretty uh, helpful in that sense. It, besides being colonials, we are, it, it really helped us evolve. So definitely we can call a lot of retrospectively or from the outside non-Western civilizations as sound art. Uh, what do you think about uh, popular music uh, being able to maybe most successfully build bridges between like the most uh, deep sound art and the most deep music only in the sense of rhythm, melody and I don't know. I, like, I was listening and, and, and for me there shouldn't be a barrier so deep between music and sound art. I think that everything should be called music, you know. And then that's like that's only an opinion. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and then at the same time, we have like examples of of uh, uh, like pieces either of music or of sound art that are completely to one side of the or to the other, if you put music and sound. Mm -hmm. But then maybe it's really interesting to focus on the ones that are in the middle, and that could be both. Absolutely. And I think uh, popular music could be doing it, popular music could be doing a better job in it than academic ones. Yeah. Um, academic, as yes. <laughs> Academic equals boring, equals institutionalized. It has a very bad connotation. We, I called it art music for the sake of argument earlier. Uh, but yeah, the, it's interesting to extend the conversation and include pop music into that thing. The, the, again, not only for the sake of time, uh, but all, I excluded the uh, pop music because it really plays under different marketing rules and um, it, it reaches the audience in completely different ways. You know, there's always some promotion strategy behind it. It's a, again, there's a completely different framework. And um, the way pop music can reach sound art, I think it's... 
I'm, I'm not sure uh, because I'm always troubled with the, with the term pop music to begin with. And you were quotating in the air like pop music. What exactly is that? Billie Eilish is pop music. Beethoven sold more records than Billie Eilish. So is he pop music? This is also Maybe he was pop in his time. Like he definitely was. Definitely. But I'm saying he no. still sells more records. Well, yeah, still but like, not. But but there's like uh, anyway. Of the no, there's like there's like an academia behind academic music. Uh, well, Maybe that's the I, I would like to call it more a community. The, the thing with uh, the, 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 the pop product is built with the idea that it should fit anywhere from the, the shack, the slam, to the to the villa in whatever you know from a cheap house to you know the, the high class posh people and that comes with the strategy and an idea that I'll give you an example I'll illustrate a bit more um, Shakira is a very popular artist and she's super proud from the fact that at any point she can put on her reggae shoes her pop shoes her Latin shoes her rock shoes and she can go wherever the hell she wants. So this means she's super adjustable and at any moment she can sell records to anybody from Lebanon to Colombia to Lithuania to Greece. Yeah, but like it's like there are like a lot of examples of, of music like uh, outside of the realms of Shakira and outside of the realms of academia at the same time that they're not created to fit everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that I would, I don't know if correctly that I would like uh, label more as pop than as. Can you illustrate with an example? Uh, I don't know. Kid Koala came to my mind, who was a DJ who mixed jazz and music oh, LPs yeah, so. in the late 90s, oh, beginning yeah. of the 2000s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some uh, underground hip hop artists, like underground now uh, mm -hmm. electronic artists okay, that are right. more into. And that it's not, it's not exactly no, no, I, now I see what you mean. academic news. Now I see what you mean. It, it, basically, if we bring together the pop, again, let's call it pop for the sake of conversation, attitude with some sort of academic techniques, we get this middle of this road uh, music called Electronica that is, is like pretty powerful in terms of you know, the technique and the way they use sound, all these things that we discussed. But it also kind of like seems to be appealing more to people seems to be more connected to their lives and that is absolutely true and even like i'm sorry but even like super super famous things like what beatles did with sound recordings or pink floyd is crazy because yeah, it's yeah, old yeah, yeah, yeah you know yeah. and then a lot of a lot of times i hear the speech that sometimes would seem unable to connect music in the this with art sound but it's been done already yeah i was really Several hoping times. you would mention the beatles I was really hoping you would mention the Beatles with that one. It's like how you can say, okay, yeah, pop music, yeah, definitely not Sakira. Two minute masterpieces. And how do they do that? Nobody knows. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, but yeah, they bring all this technological innovation. They, but then again, to, to today's subject, how does that relate to the gallery context? I can only think of the multimedia approach. Like some sort of electronica DJ set, but there's some sort of VJ doing live electronics. Yeah, Bjork it could work. Has done it, for example. Bjork is a good example, but you know, Bjork can be adjustable from uh, the concert venue to a gallery to a record to the closing ceremony of the Athens Olympics <laughs> in 2014. What a disaster! Anyway, yeah, but again. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you brought it up, but honestly, I didn't really need to extend to that one because of some sort of like shifting I the cultural frame, definitely, like, yeah, especially, the especially the Beatles. <laughs> Just like it's like, and it's like I, I'm, I'm like when I do music, I'm more towards the, I would be, away from the, <laughs> from the, sound artist part, but I don't see it like that. I think it's stupid to see it like that. Um, and and like it it troubles me in, in a good way you know i was listening to you speak and i super enjoyed the talk thank you very much and i was thinking like yeah that's the stuff you know i want to go there you know and then like it's like we we found in the way we teach music like i know for example that in lmpa you either study electronic music or acoustic composition mm, not quite okay 
But only yesterday I just told everybody you're one team. I don't see anything different in what you do. Yeah, and, and that should be the that should be the goal for the Euros. Yeah. But there's there's always been this. I know that. Yeah, I know about the division. Uh, yeah, and for me as well, it's silly. I mean, I think we should. Uh, I'm just up for the finding ways to end it. Yeah. Because of what you say, for the the profoundness that can come with listening to anybody. Yeah, it could be Slayer, Subert, Beatles, or any sort of <laughs> academic composer. Yeah. Yeah. I would mention some other bands that might be a bit too underground, so I just wanted to make sure the reference goes through. <laughs> well, I know, regarding what you said, one problem is that I think 90% of pop music is voice and lyrics. And a lot of what the music that, you know, when something sounds out, it seems, well, yeah, when you start with lyrics and like when the focus uh, ends up being on like, I, I love you or I hate you or, uh, or whatever, that kind of gets away from mm -hmm. what you're getting to, which is a deeper sound base. Of but, but still, we can or see. A, in, which is common in acad academic and instrumental music, but people seem to prefer musical lyrics, generally speaking, in pop to instrumental. I said, pair the voice from a ball. So, like, for lots of people, like, it's <laughs> like, like, more boring, yeah, like, you need, they need the extra stimulus, it seems, with the lyrics. Which is, I mean, that's, yeah, that, that's a whole. Very different. Yeah, that's a huge, a very interesting subject, whether or not uh, we can see um, the idea of absolute music. There's even a book about that, the idea of absolute music connecting to the language you were saying earlier, the vocabulary. And um, uh, how much is that the real music, as the book suggests, that if you want to explore and understand the art of music, you must remove it from lyrics. Because we don't need music to just carry the meaning that the lyrics are saying. But of course, there is this attitude and the approach that is quite popular, as you mentioned. That if you want to live the real emotions, you should get rid of the words. That's a good way to put it. And, but of course, there's the exact opposite approach that says, when you bring together language, words, the poet, the, the poet and you know, the emotions through the words that we all understand, and you underline them, you enha no, enhance them with music, then voila, that's why pop music is popular and it sells records and it touches people's hearts and not taking anything away from that by the way just a personal statement uh, as long as we have human beings have a bo body we will want to sing and we will want to dance and uh, you know using our voice and singing and sharing our feelings and obviously talking through music and sounds is something fundamentally human very important and it must be definitely aspect of our lives the only problem is that we allow pro the professionals and the people on the records to do that for us. The best thing would be to start doing it again altogether. But it's not in words, even in travel. Even that, even it's that. <laughs> but you know, words yeah. sort of underline some communal meanings. Think of a national anthem. It brings together five million people when they hear those words and that music. For good or bad reasons, but it does. Yeah, but about this this voice and <laughs> lyrics, it's I really like I don't like lyrics actually. I really like this instrumental music in general. But what I really like about the singing that you are not listening to the word, but you feeling this voice, the the color of a voice, the tone, but the voice becoming an instrument itself. So that's I like. I don't need the words that is all about, but as a voice, as a powerful instrument, it's very, it could be included in, even in instrument, as a equal instrument in the music. So yeah, I found it very much in this. Did you say uh, that, that uh, more effort is required to, like pop music requires the least effort to understand them? In terms of effort, if, would you say is it better to rank the... Mm, I, I don't like rankings and categorizing. If anything, I, 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 it takes a whole of a lot of effort to understand Billie Eilish from my behalf. I, I, it really just like it's a pain in the butt to figure out what the hell is going on with her. But the students keep on mentioning her, so I had to. The social context, you know, the shape of the. Everything, taste, meaning, you know, how I was born. I mean, if noise is unwelcome sound, the most pop music is noise to me. And I, I and I'd make a struggle and an effort to understand it. 
but yeah, no, no categorization whatsoever. It's just you know how you're born and what environment you're in. There's no better, worse, or nothing like that. That's that's no, absolutely not. I saw some paintings about your um, you know how you were comparing the visual with the sound, and you were making like a nice distinction between them, like a stronger distinction. Whereas for me, they seem to be like extremely close. Especially in the making of sound and making of visual art, because mm -hmm. the at least you know the inner feeling is like the same whether you create music or you create visual art. So it seems to me that also the visual art is very much immersive in a way. It's just I guess we we have like we're so used to visual art the same as probably we're so used to hearing like music everywhere that we don't immerse ourselves anymore in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, I'm not taking anything away from visual arts oh, and its power. Uh, I mean, s standing in front of famous pair, I hope I see to Botticelli after that. Okay, standing in front of that painting in Florence, uh, my knees were shaking, right? It's, and it was just this thing in front of me. Theoretically, I would not respond to something like that. It's a visual, right? Oh my God. I was like elsewhere, totally elsewhere. Um, but uh, physiologically, as human beings, there is this difference in the perception. Like you, you always see something that's not that you know. You always have to keep a distance with the scene. Uh, if I may make an uh, analogy with films, uh, they're trying to use all this new technology, three D and all that, to make it. Imp the only way that you can make a, th a film immersive is basically through sound. That's immediately where the film gets depth, when the film gets you know extra life and so on. Unless, I don't know, in the director is Fellini or Tarkovsky or Kurosawa. But after that, and Bergman, after that, you know, you need sound. This is where, you know, some, the visuals need sonic aid in order to create this extra depth, this extra dimension, this extra feeling uh, that you just cannot have with a two-dimensional thing. I, I, and I really think that the three-dimensional, especially movies, just to, to make people, besides selling more expensive tickets, is about this idea that you're going in. But, you know, I can go much more into Stalker, Tarkovsky's, than to the last Star Wars. As far as, the, you know, organic technology, content and style. I, I understood your reference about vision versus um, music. I think just basically, almost physiologically and then, you know, the way the brain works, it's neural adjustment. Because, you know... Even if, even if you paint like an immersive like uh, painting like the Sistine Chapel and all the, and you do a whole like mosaic, uh, you know, frescoes of everything and whatever, the thing is that the eyes have to be looking somewhere and the eyes by definition actually only see clearly like roughly like 1% of something you can front of you at any given one moment and the rest is just like scanning, scanning, scanning and your brain making up an image mm -hmm. from like scan. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, I think an ear functions, I mean, less an expert than you. No, I think, know, but I think it functions differently. I think maybe the perception of the ear is more yeah. continuous. Like I it just comes in. Yeah. 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 It doesn't have like the same, it's not like much like a radar beam, which eyes is what are eyes are all like. It's more like a continuous uh, but field of perception. But hearing ear. too, no? Because you can, you can put away things you're hearing to focus on one. Yeah. But like, uh, if, if someone was speaking mm -hmm. there and I would like to hear what they were saying, yeah. I would just consciously shut what was happening here. It's called ears dropping and don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, 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 the most simple thing to say about this, you can always close your eyes, you can never close your ears. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I understand that, but, like, I agree with, uh, I agree with, like, I think could be that a lot of this is the way we social constructed things around visual more than mm. because I think we have the capacity to focus on sound and to the point that it's also a bit innate that some people do some sort of genes and then a bit of training knowing which frequency is the sound mm. uh, there's something really interesting to me in that regard which is a bit I don't know if it's stupid no it's not stupid but it's like really simple it's the, the Buba Kiki effect uh, the Buba Kiki effect is something that uh, was designed by uh, neuroscientists to talk about how one uh, uh, sensory system could relate to another. 
so they would draw like a really roundish figure. Oh, I remember that. And they yeah. would draw like a figure yeah. like that, yeah. and mm -hmm. they would ask people to name one of them Buba and one of them Titi. Mm -hmm. And then everyone would name them the same. So mm -hmm. all, yeah. all, all name their yeah, own some yeah, yeah, some and the yeah. other one Titi. Some <laughs> some <laughs> which like means that sound and visual are connected in our brain. We, we, we are perceiving things in multi-sensory, you know, this is, we are multi-sensory beings, of course. Of course but even if, when we're only listening, we're shouting and die, we, we see images in our minds. We, yeah, you know, yeah. we, we're constructed that way. This, again, there's nothing wrong with that. I didn't want to make any uh, right and wrong distinctions, yeah. just to clarify that. But. I actually also really like the, the idea about this, that, that sound is penetrating. Uh, really, and I, I think, I, I believe in this, because uh, so sound is by, by itself you know, harmful to the person and just, um, yeah, it's hard to close ears in all the different spaces, but with the closed eyes it's easy. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that, and uh, uh, I used to look so much to sound when I used to be a, a specialist musician uh, <laughs> because they were they were not giving me the freedom uh, to hear this piece of music on my own will so I I could look for it for some kind of human power I know a composer friend of mine extremely sensitive sonically who complained about street musicians especially in Athens because you know what do they do in order to uh, to be heard more and have more um, you know audience and hopefully more money they amplify themselves mm -hmm. so you get this acoustic guitar okay in here or in the street it might be you know the, the, the damage is localized but as soon as they plug <laughs> in the bloody amplifier you can hear them all over Pilius Gatve and you know it just really affects the environment these are um, sensitivities you were mentioning about like the training like you know we we do not train people from, from a young age to be a bit more aware, to open up their ears, to be a bit more sensitive and not feel this sort of oral rape whenever you go down a main street. Or just go to coffee every day. Yeah, well, you didn't really there. There. nothing wrong. Just I there. mean, like, and if you tell them something, they will just say, but, okay, listen, this, no. <laughs> this is our music and, like, this is what people are doing. But this is my choice to go into the coffee place. She's talking about just walking down the street. It's like you impose that thing into her ears. It's like, why? And it, it escapes this whole charming street musician thing, the busker that creates the atmosphere. It can be quite imposing. I, I, I totally understand that. I totally understand that. It, but it does, yeah, come from traditions, this and that, blah, 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 whatever. If they amplified, they get fine and they should be good. Minimum, minimum. Oh. But you can perceive that uh, you know, sound art. I mean, yeah. Yeah, that yeah, people do that. People do that. Time. Context. Yeah, people yeah. do that. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Um, well, maybe we have a, a question about. I don't know. Um, now the boss is here. You tell us what's well, next. Well, I'm not. I'm not about the boss. Uh, the God from above. Ah, he's about. Yeah, it's a small world. No, until it's until we we like to. to I mean, I can imagine the people who are actually people bored people by the whole drop. thing and they feel socially awkward. Like, when is this going to end? I need to get up and get the hell out of here. Please do that if you feel like it. people don't drop, we, we shouldn't stop. 8.35 and you stand on the web on Facebook and talk till 9. Oh, yeah. uh, we, don't, we don't go out of here until we solve the problem. Is, it, is, yeah, it, yeah. is the door locked? We need so, uh, so in that we case, to Manuel, Kalima, Mitav, Yana, yeah, Archie. Thank you. Yeah, and my question is about, um, as you studied your presentation, you just said about what you are creating, how you are what this music have as hard stuff, make it or buy it, it's not a conversation about it. So what's it's your opinion about the album as itself? Because now it's very popular to listen to just small pieces of all or whatever, pop or other type of music, but it's just part of it. And you still found the album as important thing to do? And what do you feel about different about one 
small piece of, for example, one album, which is case of the multiple releases in the film. And you, what do you think in the future album thing will exist or it will dissipate mm. in, in mm. this kind of thing? Thank you. Mr. Garacho. Um, I, I can only respond very personally to this one. Uh, I still believe in the album. I use the word believe. I, I, I think it's important for um, for music to take its time to unfold, especially sound-based music, to kind of like release its characteristics, to be able to submerge into it and enjoy it. Uh, it goes a little bit to what we were saying earlier about things have to be like in the CD single kind of thing. CD single. Hey, I, I give up my age when I say CD single. The idea of, you know, the short piece that, oh, we have to get this really quickly and then move on to the next one, really quickly move on to the next one. I don't want to make music to become part of a playlist. I, I, I would like to politely ask for the audience's full attention for an extended period of time where they can experience the music's impact in its full. And um, I also think that, the, no, again, nothing taking away from short durations, the masterpieces of the Beatles or uh, the Ronettes or anything else. And that is really as it comes from me. Uh, as far as the album existing in the future, that's like your guess is as good as mine. Um, especially when we release CDs these days, we don't do it obviously not to make money. Uh, and I don't think we're even interested in the, you know, the selling out or anything like that. Making a CD album these days is basically more like uh, throwing a message in a bottle in the ocean of time. And this means like the more of these bottles are out there, maybe in 10, 15 years, if we still are able to play a CD, uh, more people will listen. I think the key word here is immortality. The return back to the idea of recording. Recording is a promise of immortality. You can replay and replay, yeah, replay. I mean, I'll be gone, these things will be here. CD, but in general, you can put it on in just uh, just a uh, digital way, but still uh, so some part of the songs, you just put it in some kind of sequence. With some I, I think the, the album it gives it. a very holistic and complete uh, idea what the music maker wants to manifest. Uh, with the playlists and those all, all these like, I, I really like all this new media because I do have access to music I never had before. But I have to acknowledge the danger. Um, when I was uh, growing up, I had to wait for a new album to come out. I would save money to buy the record and I would play the record again and again and again. Nowadays, I can, with literally two clicks, I have the whole, of this, the, the whole discography of Stockhausen and I go like, ah, next, 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 next. I mean, I click m faster than I can, you know, uh, listen and relate to the piece. But oh, two minutes, ah, next, two seconds, next, next. And this idea of like consuming, put it this way, music has become information. It's all digital zeros and ones. It, it's information, yeah, communication. Yeah, there's this music that says, but, but well, what I mean right now is like, it's zeros and ones the same way that you post an Instagram uh, photo. It's the same code. And it started with recording because in the recording, let's say uh, anything, even in analog times. Hold on, hold on. This is not... This is actually, yeah, it's funny idea about the I'll tell you. Because when recording reduced the idea of sound into um, some sort of uh, inform data information. Whether you record your voice, whether you record a string quartet, the microphone and the recorder respond and react and work in the same way. And with digital technology, it's even more abstract because everything is zeros and ones. Uh, but to finish up answering your question, because it is a third one, the, uh, I, I still believe in the album in the complete long duration work uh, and more so in the concert. And I cannot invite you in a concert and play you a four-minute piece. I would like you know all of us to experience an extended immersion in sound, uh, extended at least for today's standards. I mean, concerts might be much longer than we can feel today is enough. We really, we really can only accept short segments of time because that's how much we can feel, we can focus and concentrate. Music resists to that, whether CD, digital concert, album, music is a tool of resisting to this continuous oppression of time 
and the way it, it should naturally unfold and allow us to sink into the experiences, understand what we're going through instead of next, 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 next. And that's why I think one tool for that is extended durations, albums, and big concerts. But you were. Yeah, yeah. no, I was really speaking to that. First of all, it's sometimes actually people when, you know, when you do that thing, which I, I know musicians don't like, but you do something else like work or read a book, and this, this, sometimes it's very convenient to just let spot, let the album for you determine what you're going to listen to for the next one hour, two hours, and and then sometimes like. Consumers with music, actually, I don't know that everyone, like, all the time is like, okay, let's just play, 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 play. Sometimes you actually just like, you know what, whatever Spotify playlist or whatever the album uh, or whatever, you know, Beethoven says I should listen to for the next one hour or, you know, sometimes you now you can even choose to listen to the whole symphony for five hours if you wanted to and like spend the whole day just doing uh, the same, uh, basically, Spotify album. You know, sometimes it's, very people choose to like you know just whatever is given to me by the by the format uh, okay I'll take it I'll take it I'll take it until okay maybe you want to okay the other thought to keep on I had is maybe actually people will listen more to some symphonic music if it's like it's convenient to split it's like like to split like some symphonic movement into okay like three minutes from the ninth symphony <laughs> the fourth movement and like two minutes or five minutes from this so yeah maybe because I think a lot of like it's a it's a struggle these days to convince people to listen to like a twenty five minutes music uh, and, and for them to you know uh, you know to think that they should sometimes they don't appreciate like the tenth minute but somewhere in the fifteenth minute some dramatic conclusion is gonna come and you know they, they really want this like five minutes that seems to me like a mass yeah of absolutely energy. Uh, you use the key word here. They consumed music. I prefer seeing listeners as participants <coughs> in music. Here's, here's a big difference here. And uh, industry perspective. Yeah, that's what I say. As soon, that's why sound art is a bit tricky because it brings in these ideas of industry and market and all those things, and that's what makes it a bit tricky. Something that originally became it was supposed to be this sort of like a almost revolutionary idea of uh, bringing different contexts and provoking and challenging. Then it's yeah okay whatever it became a trend as uh, yeah, no has said. To us. Yeah. So th th this is time it was just something new which is really. I'm going to change it. Unknown. Yeah. Then, but now it's becoming it's. Really but uh, but as far as the the, the is my sensitivity as a musician regarding the Noir symphony for example is, okay, chopping it down to three minutes is like say. Would you take Fellini's Roma and chop it down in bits and watch five minutes and then maybe three more minutes the next day? You wouldn't do that. I mean, it's. But there are people that do that when music I like know, this. I know. I've like seen that. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like the classic scene Still from the Godfather, or the, the classic scene from yesterday. I saw from from the the, the big uh, scam or whatever it was. The Guilty as charged. Was like, um, Guilty as charged. I can suggest YouTube sting, channels that do that. Yeah, like okay, the poker scene from the Sting, or this uh, scene from like the Goodfellas. Absolutely, a guilty as charged, but we cannot. We should identify that this really. I mean, in, in the end, we're going to ask for uh, filmmakers to make uh, two-minute pieces because we don't have more time to devote on their art. That will really affect the uh, practice, won't it? <laughs> It'll be very depressing. <laughs> I understand. I understand. But yeah. It's Gerk. 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 <laughs> Gerkite. Gerkite. <laughs> Directly, I could be directly for that because I was very careful to um, time change my <laughs> schedule. But it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Are we supposed to forgive you or something? Well, I don't yeah, care. Yeah, yeah. It's fine. <laughs> 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 Who's gonna forgive me? Ask me to speak with the guy who's looking from above. <laughs> what do you want to do? <laughs> Here was a great debate by I think it was a great presentation and I did have the pleasure to listen to it, no, because it was recorded, right? Yeah, so I right. listened to it. Huh? Any more questions or comments? Just while I'm <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Um, did I understand right when you said that um, you call it art music, academic music? Yeah, that's that again music? like art. Acad well, academic basically means that it's been you know somebody was trained to do that ah, kind okay. of music. So you sort of like follow the rules that the teacher says and things like that. It was burning it kind of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But in the beginning, I said art music, which is this like again non-pop, let's say a bit, but like coming from that tradition. I have a, I have a short anecdote from yesterday. There was a con that co concert I attended to. There was this very funny thing happening, you know. And I'm guilty of not having been to this uh, concert in the academy because it's a big sport. But musicians would go back to the backstage. Every single act, they would come back, and then audience would clap down. They would come back, audience claps again, and then they go back to the backstage. So you know, bowing twice. And I'm speaking to my colleague, and I'm saying, "What is this ritual? You know, like we are not uh, we are not doing this for the music. Yeah, it's a yeah. social ritual. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so uh, all this um, academic creation, it's not really creation. Yeah. It's not really art." The it's almost like you know a habit, like an obligation. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, we're just uh, professionals are building the same thing over and over and over. Yeah. Like Manuel was saying, that other pockets where you can do the exciting things, you know, new yeah. things that are, have to do with what the sound represents. And it's all these conventions, the, the, the dressing, yeah. the you know the, the 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 audience reacting this way or the other yes, way. Yes. Yeah, I'm with you 100% on this one, and that's why I think you know bringing in musical practice notions that were born, or at least were expressed more vividly through the concepts of sound art challenges this sort of like very stiff old school rules, very bourgeoisie, very like late 19th century. We're like 2020, and still people are doing that. I understand the value, I understand the tradition, I understand where it's coming from, but for crying out loud. <laughs> That is needed to then be able to create those pop creations because all that it's not simple to make pop. Music. No, absolutely right. not. So no. you really need to have all this uh, skill to make, which you yeah. learn presumably from this. Yeah, good tan, you know, you know good body. <laughs> Think yeah. that? I'm just kidding. It really, it's really, it's a. Uh, it can be a very you know demanding and skillful process to make pop music. Absolutely. Yeah. But again, this like I, I see everything as a notion. Like there's always some sort of interconnectivity. And I think we can finish here, I suppose everybody's tired. It's not like, oh, music is one kind of thing, but definitely we can see connections, influences, in, and instead of start trying to just really divide and say that this belongs there, this belongs there, try to find out how do they connect, what sort of dialogue they can have between them, and still maintain each one's character and which one's, you know, even a very personal uh, creative drive or whatever it is. And by creative, I don't mean only the composer, I also include the listener. Thank you. Thank you.